Hey, it's Mazzy and welcome back. And here's a video on my top 10 jazz artists on vinyl. Quality over quantity, quantity over quality. That's always the, the question. That's one of the questions, not always the question. And in this video, I'm going over quantity. So these aren't necessarily my top 10 favorite jazz artists of all time. Although based on quantity, they sort of reflect that. But what I'm going to do is do a countdown from 10 to 1 the artists that I have the most records from. So obviously number one is the larger uh, collection, discography, and then down to number 10. Now, a few artists, let me just mention before, that are not on the list that kind of surprised me. I thought they would be. Um, one was Duke Ellington, who I love. Now, CDs are separate. If I was to count my CD collection, maybe eventually I'll do one on just a CD because that tells another uh, picture, and, and I have larger discographies on a lot of these artists uh, that didn't make the top 10 list, as well as the ones that did. So Duke Ellington would be one, uh, Charles Mingus would be one, Wayne Shorter, uh, Weather Report, oh God. Um, now, okay, those of you who have seen my uh, tour of my record room, this is my record room, these three sections over and down are my jazz collection, starting with my Music Matters Jazz on those top two cubicles, and then Alpha Order all the way uh, down. So we're going to start here with number 10, and I'll give you an idea of what I have more or less. So coming in at number 10 is Art Blakey. Art Blakey. I'm going to just show several albums of each artist. I'm not going to go through the entire collection. With Art Blakey, I have 16 albums by Art Blakey. Uh, probably number one is Monin. Uh, what a great record. What a great tune. Just a gorgeous, a gorgeous record. Uh, that's the uh, Bobby Timmons tune. Uh, there later was a um, Lambert Hendricks and Ross version of it, the vocal, jazz vocals that John Hendricks wrote lyrics to. And what a great album. Now, I've always said this about Art Blakey. Night in Tunisia, another great one. Look at this typeface cover. And then there's this one, just makes it, I love the cover, but indestructible, great Art Blakey uh, record. What's great about Art Blakey is what a talent scout he was. Like Miles Davis, like John Mayall, a lot of great musicians went through sort of the school of Art Blakey. Uh, and here you got Lee Morgan, Curtis Fuller, Wayne Shorter, Cedar Walton, Reginald Workman, and and obviously Art Blakey, band leader as drummer, drummer as band leader. And here, you pretty much got the same uh, lineup. So for the most part, pretty close. Later, obviously, he, so many jazz musicians went through the school of Art Blakey. Now, in terms of my personal experience in the 70s, uh, uh, Keystone Corner was the jazz club in San Francisco. I was able to see all these great jazz artists, right, literally from around 73, 4, uh, to the end of the decade and, and, and beyond. And I saw Art Blakey three times, tiny club, amazing jazz club. So I feel very fortunate that almost all, I'll call out the ones I have seen and haven't seen of these top 10, but um, Art Blakey, uh, just what a powerhouse and what an amazing, uh, amazing drummer, one of the greatest jazz drummers of all time. Coming in at number nine. Number nine is Herbie Hancock. Herbie Hancock, I have 17 albums by. Uh, this wonderful taking off with uh, Freddie Hubbard, Dexter Gordon, Butch Warren, and Billy Higgins. This is the one that spawned the song that became a hit, Watermelon Man. Obviously, he redoes it later in the 70s with his uh, more electronic sound. Uh, Hugo Montu, um Negro did a great song, had a hit of it, actually. Fantastic record. What a great artist. Uh, still alive, still with us. Incredible artist. The other one, which is a Music Matters jazz cover, and that is uh, Maiden Voyage. Another, another great album with George Coleman, Freddie Hubbard, Herbie Hancock, uh, Ron Carter, Herbie Hancock, obviously, it's his album, and the great Tony Williams. And, of course, Tony, Ron... And um, this is almost, except for Wayne Short is not on here, you know, part of the second quintet with uh, that played with Miles Davis. Incredible piano player. And I thought I'd mix it up and show something from the 70s period, from 1973, which was a huge transitional period. A couple years after uh, Miles Davis did Bitches Brew, 
and that is Herbie Hancock's Sextant. Um, this is where he gets all in on Moog synthesizer, experimental. Uh, the professor, Pat Gleason, who I knew for many, many years, still alive actually as a composer in Los Angeles, really kind of helped Herbie kind of get into the whole electronic keyboard synthesizer uh, mode on this. And this is a one hell of a spacey record. Again, the ones I'm showing here aren't necessarily my favorite, but I think I just want to show a little bit of a representation. Obviously, Rocket was the big crossover hit all over MTV and everything. I just didn't want to show that. This is, to me, much more, more interesting. Herbie Hancock. Coming in at number eight. Number eight is the great, great trumpet player, vocalist, Chet Baker. Chet Baker, I have 18 albums by now. I am a huge fan of the moodiness, the vocal, the soft uh, arrangements, and that just that whisper of a vocal pattern of Chet Baker. Some don't like his, uh, his vocal style and stay away from this. To me, of all the tone poets, this might be my favorite. Uh, Chet Baker sings it's unlike anything else in the tone poet uh, or v <laughs> release. But I just love this album, and uh, this is going to, I think, coming back in, uh, they're going to repress it soon. So I suggest if you don't have any, if you, you know, sample it online, it's such a wonderful late night, early Sunday morning record. Chet Baker sings, and of course his trumpet playing. Uh, I collect these Sam records out of France. These are recordings from the late 50s, and they're just beautiful. Uh, most of them are not vocals, they're all instrumental, but just a great sound. And then this, these were... It, released individually and also as a box set with an extra cut. And this uh, is um, legendary Riverside albums that are uh, wonderful. Chet Baker, New York. Chet Baker Sings and Chet Baker. Beautiful covers, beautiful music, sexy as hell. He plays Lerner and Lowe, uh, the trad songs, traditional songbook stuff, and then outtakes and alternatives, which only comes in the box set. So. That's coming in at number eight. I have 18 records by Chet Baker. So Chet Baker is someone I never saw. Uh, missed him, unfortunately. I, I love this sort of swan song, uh, the film Let's Get Lost. You should check it out. It's worth worth seeing, obviously, in his older age, and it's a different, a, a totally different Chet Baker uh, very close to uh, his death, as I recall. And I did see Herbie Hancock uh, several times over the years with VSOP, the one-time reunion, uh, with Tony uh, Tony Williams and Wayne Shorter, with Freddie Hubbard sitting in for the, in the Miles role and uh, Ron Carter on bass, and that was great. And I've seen him several times uh, playing piano over the years. So very fortunate uh, to have seen them in the 70s and into the uh, 80s also. Coming in number seven is the great Ella Fitzgerald, possibly the greatest female vocalist ever. I did a video calling it that. I love her. This is the one, this is my entry to Ella in the 70s. I picked this up, hearing it on the radio. The version of How High the Moon, the scatting, Mac the Knife at the end of this record is, is sublime. It's a gorgeous rendition. Her live shows take on a whole different dimension than her studio work, but I do love her studio work. Uh, this is a wonderful, uh, Collection on Verve, Clap Hands, Here Comes Charlie. Love this. Norman Grant's produced her. Norman Grant's was the uh, founder of Verve Records and later, in later years, Pablo Records and had her on both those labels. Started Verve because of Ella Fitzgerald and fantastic record. And of course, I couldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak about some of her songbook series. And this is the George and Ira Gershwin. She's done Cole Porter, so many others with these Great Bernard Buffett uh, cover art pieces, and this is a reissue box that came out a number of years ago. But Ella Fitzgerald, one of the great, great singers. I did see her once at the Venetian Room of the Fairmont Hotel uh, in the very late 70s. Uh, fantastic still at that point. Such, such a show person, show woman, showman, a great performer, and just just... You could tell that she loved her audience and just wanted to sing and wanted to perform. And, and what a voice she had, even in the late 70s. I mean, beautiful, beautiful, wonderful woman, Ella Fitzgerald. Okay, coming in number six. Six and five are two artists that kind of cross over in terms of the quantity, 
but one of my favorite all-time jazz artists is this person. And this is Charlie Parker. Really pretty much the father of bebop. Probably the greatest jazz artist ever, saxophone player. Uh, this is the um, complete dial and studio recordings from Savoy Records as well. Fantastic multi-box set. Now, I'm counting all the discs in these box sets to talk about these things. I mean, some box sets are more of a collection. Some are individual albums, but I think it represents my interest. Uh, this is a wonderful set as well. This is the Mercury and Clef 10 inch collection and fantastic covers. The whole 10 inch, I have a bunch of jazz 10 inch reissues. So this I believe was Kraft as well. And um, Bird and Diz, Dizzy Gillespie, who I had the wonderful opportunity to hang out with at the K Jazz a booth at the Monterey Jazz Festival in 1978. Obviously, Charlie Parker died way before I would have even had a chance to see him live. So uh, he did a series of albums, Norman Grant's the Philharmonic with strings. Uh, some people think they're over the top, but they're just gorgeous stuff. Sort of the, you know, one of the early, one of the founders of bebop jazz musician, which music, which I think doesn't get a lot of love around here. Uh, one of the greatest artists of all time, Charlie Parker. Love him. Love Let me throw out these uh, Charlie Parker records as well. Again, one of the major artists on Verve Records, Norman Grant's recordings, and Night and Day, Charlie Parker and his orchestra. Again, just wonderful music. And uh, Machito, Charlie Parker, Volume 4, Afro-Cuban Jazz. Him along with Dizzy Gillespie, Machito, and uh, brought that uh, jazz-Cuban a hybrid of music and collaboration, which is, is amongst some of my favorite music. Mm -hmm. Charlie Parker, I have uh, 21 plus records of Charlie Parker's. Now, Thelonious Monk, I have 21 plus a box. And the box I'll start with is the Complete Prestige 10 inch collection. Again, one of these craft issues. Sonny Rollins and Thelonious Monk. These The combinations, the Titans, Jazz Titans doing these records. Thelonious Monk. Thelonious Monk, Thelonious Monk. I always, in my mind, and I, they're nothing really alike, but maybe because they both have M's, Thelonious Monk and Charlie Mingus, I always kind of fuse them, and they're really nothing alike musically, but they're just, to me, such geniuses. And as I said, Mingus is not on this list. I love Mingus. I have probably more on a compact disc, but um, he just missed a list. I probably have about 12, 13 uh, Mingus record. Okay, Thelonious Monk we have here. Thelonious Monk with Sonny Rollins, Ernie Henry, and Clark Terry. And this is Brilliant Corners. Fantastic record. What a great cover photograph that is. Monk and Coltrane. And this was a later unissued from a French soundtrack. And Thelonious Monk, uh, this is basically the first version of Dangerous Liaisons. You might know that film, uh, the Malkovich version. This was a uh, the original French version, and he did the soundtrack. He played it, improvised while they were doing it. This is a Sam Records release. Highly, highly recommended. Charlie Rouse, Barney Willen, uh, and Thelonious Monk, Sam Jones, Art Taylor on drums. Uh, fantastic. Find this record. Beautiful cover. Just just soothing. And and um, I love these jazz artists like him and Miles did uh, some soundtracks for French films that really didn't get much traction over here during a time when, you know, the Europeans to this day still seem to be more on the jazz bandwagon of American jazz artists than we are. And then lastly, this. This is from the found tape of the 1968 high school gym recording near Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Uh, it's it's lo-fi, but it's such a great performance. He showed up and played this 40-minute set or so. And the janitor recorded this, and it came out uh, the last couple of years. Uh, Monk and Palo Alto, it w made one of my best of t a year and a half ago, two years ago or so. Uh, Thelonious Monk. And Thelonious Monk, I have 21 plus in the box set. Great jazz stuff, and that's number five on my list. Maybe my favorite jazz pianist of all time is Bill Evans. Bill Evans Trio, Sunday the Village, Vanguard featuring Scott LaFaro. One of the most beautiful, intimate live recordings you'll ever hear. Uh, this is my copy from the fabulous box 
from Analog Productions, 45 RPM. Hopefully they reissue that. And this has all his Riverside output. I was able to see Bill Evans twice, again, around 75, 76. Very intimate settings, and what what an amazing player. You all know uh, him on Kind of Blue, that little intro piano thing with Miles Davis, the biggest selling jazz album of all time. But he is my favorite. This is his a debut solo record on Riverside. He was signed by Orrin Keep News. I was able to have conversations with Orrin in the 78, 79 period when he did a radio show after my girlfriend's uh, show on the weekends at K-San Radio in San Francisco. He had a jazz show. So he would come in every week with his wife and he would talk about Monk and Bill Evans. And while he was getting ready, I can't remember if he was before or after uh, Nancy's show, but while his wife was helping him file records and pull records out that he would brought, I would have conversations uh, with him a little bit because I was getting into jazz again, going to the Keystone that decade and uh, was getting into these artists. But Bill Evans was the guy he signed and he developed and just had a great relationship. This is probably his signature song and that's Waltz for Debbie. What a, a lovely piece of music, his album title. Waltz for Debbie, and everybody digs Bill Evans with this iconic uh, typography on the cover again on Riverside Records and Explorations. There's so many uh, Bill Evans, there's later stuff he did with Tony Bennett way in, way in the 70s. There's uh, the blues and abstract, which is a bigger sound, and it has Oliver Nelson, Eric Dolphy, Roy Haynes, Freddie Hubbard, and Paul Chambers. This is somewhat like if jazz was orchestrated, which it occasionally is, but it's that kind of different vibe, and it's just a gorgeous sounding record. This is from the Acoustic Sounds 60th anniversary series, and highly recommended too. Not as intimate as those, but beautiful, just the same. Bill Evans. I have uh, 23 Bill Evans records. I include the individual records in that box. 23 Bill Evans records in my collection. Probably the sweetest combination of jazz, piano playing, and vocals in my collection that I'm a fan of is Nat King Cole. A lot of people who aren't into jazz know his pop uh, records from Capitol Records from the 1960s, obviously the Christmas song, his version of that uh, wonderful Christmas classic. And I would argue he made the definitive version of that Mel Torme song. This is a sweet spot record that everyone should get. There is an audiophile version of this, I think, floating around. Not sure if it's still in print. This is not that, but even this capital mono version of this, Nat King Cole and his trio after midnight is intimate, beautifully recorded at the Capitol Tower. Uh, and the Capitol Tower uh, is the house that Nat built. He sold so many records. This is a fantastic record. Now, Just You and Me, Sweet Lorraine, Caravan, It's Only a Paper Moon. These are the classics. In my collection, this is the sweet spot. Is it too much? 27 LPs of every take he did for Capitol Records. I had the um, 18 version CD set for almost 20 years since it came out. The vinyl version my friend Coleman had in his collection and I um, inherited it from uh, the Coleman collection that I actually uh, purchased with uh, my friend Coffee Dave. This is 27 LPs and it's basically the trio a lot of the stuff that's on this record and it's it's so beautiful it is so over the top it's a lot of music it's not for everyone when you have six versions of paper moon and route 66 and all the, the variations and it, it, it's it's just a really nice balance and it's one of those records i could just grab any lp and put on any time and just i fall in love with that music and i just i'm drawn into it going in terms of the audio file analog productions this is incredible this is the nat king cole story where they replicate the uh the original box set now some of you know i'm not a huge fan of box sets usually but in this case it replicates how this record came out earlier 
It's double 45 RPM and it's gorgeous. Songs like Nature Boy, Lush Life has the Christmas song on here. And in terms of something that's gonna sound the sweetest ever on your stereo. Now in terms of Nat King Cole records, I have about 37 Nat Cole records. More on CD again, but uh, for this uh, vinyl showcase of my top 10 jazz artists, 37 Nat King Cole albums. Coming at number two on my list of the most albums I have by any one artist in, in jazz in my collection, and that's Coltrane. You can't get away without talking about Love Supreme, probably his most famous record. Spiritual record. It's got a, a dirge to it. It's got a uh, almost like a prayer, a prayer meeting uh, of sorts. It's a chant record. It's a beautiful record. It's not for everyone. I would say those of you who are not into jazz, uh, one of the, the sweet spot maybe, start with ballads. Uh, it's not a compromise. The label wanted him to do these great ballads, and he did it, and this is a beautiful record. And this has uh, McCoy Tyner, Jimmy Garrison, and Elvin Jones, great drummer Elvin Jones, of course, and uh, Rudy Van Gelder, cover photograph by the great Jim Marshall. Ballads, lovely record. Also, Lush Life, his prestige release, um, this is an analog production, beautiful recording. You can find an OJC version of this, I think fairly reasonable. This is a fantastic record uh, with Earl May on bass and Arthur Taylor on drums. And then on side two, it goes with Donald Burry, Red Garland, Paul Chambers, Louis Hayes, and Al Heath. And uh, Coltrane is probably the second most known name in jazz. And uh, we'll know who number one is after this. But Coltrane's got a whole a resurgence over the last decade or so or beyond. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't show some of these beautiful, beautiful uh, Atlantic records. When Stuff you did on Atlantic. This is the avant-garde with Don Cherry. Bags and Train. Uh, Milt Jackson, the great uh, vibraphonist and piano player uh, of the modern jazz quartet. Gorgeous record. A Latin flavor to it, Olay. Coltrane plays the blues, something that should be in every collection if you're into Coltrane. These Atlantic records are important. And of course, probably his most popular and famous of the Atlantic years is John Coltrane, Giant Step. I have, was it 34, I believe. I don't know if I got that right, but about 34, 35 John Coltrane records. That's why he's at number two. And you may be surprised who number one is. Again, I never saw Coltrane. I was too young when he passed. Never saw Coltrane. So stand by for the number one artist I have the most records of in my jazz collection. The number one artist in my jazz collection, quantity-wise, is, of course, Miles Davis. I did see Miles Davis once, 1973, Stanford outdoors opening up for the new writers of the purple sage did one song that lasted about 45 50 minutes i think you can uh, hear it on youtube i think it's out there uh, for us to hear i listened to it again recently thinking god this was pretty wild my only time i saw miles davis i have 57 miles davis records plus a couple of uh, these box sets Let's start with these. These are the uh, Prestige 10-inch Collection, Volumes 1 and Volume 2. Let's give you a little taste. Prestige. New sounds. Let's talk about my intro to Miles Davis in 1970. I didn't have any Miles Davis albums prior to that. I bought this record. I bought it home. I didn't get it. I returned it the next day. I don't remember what I said to the guy to get it back, but I exchanged it. About three years later, I finally was uh, working in a record store. Someone was playing it, and I said, what's that? And I, I got it. It took me three years from 16 years old to 19 years old to understand this record. And I love this record. That whole fusion, uh, you know, John McLaughlin on it and 
these wonderful, wonderful artists. It's it's an intense record. It's got Bernie Maupin, Chick Corea, Jack D. Jeanette, David Holland, Harvey Brooks, um, the great, great bass player, rock bass player, really bluesy, soulful bass player. Uh, fantastic record. Over the years, I've acquired this love for Miles, and he's done so many things. I just wanted to do a few shout outs. Obviously, again, you can't talk about Miles Davis with talk with without talking about Kind of Blue, the biggest jazz record sales-wise of all time. And of course, that's in my list here. One of my favorites, and a lot of people I know who are really into Miles and jazz just don't like this Gil Evans uh, combo or Sketches of Spain. It's very orchestral. It's somewhat uh, the Latin feel to it, but it's a beautiful, beautiful orchestrated uh sort of Spanish tinge of music. Fantastic record, Sketches of Spain, amongst my favorite. And I did a ranking of Miles Davis records uh, last year, early in the year sometime, and this is my favorite Miles Davis record, and this is, in a silent way, the second quintet, where to me they just gel with the great drumming of Tony Williams, Ron Carter's bass playing, Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter. Fantastic record, this to me, is that sweet spot, that crossover period of, of a, you know, realizing of rock and rolls out there, and it's not really a rock record, but it's got just some great, it's a great, great vibes to it. Not xylophone vibes, but just the, the groove is really nice and really interesting record. Again, amongst my favorite, my favorite Miles Davis record. So this is my top 10 jazz records according to quantity. Now, if I look at this list, do I think, are these my favorite artists? Miles Davis is probably not my favorite jazz artist. Who would that be? That would have to be another video, maybe. But, um, you know, there's other artists that I have a lot of that just bubbled under. Ornette Coleman's another one, the avant-garde artist like that, who has that kind of uh, out there jazz. So thanks for watching. This is my top 10 list of jazz artists in my collection. And thanks for watching again. Riverside Records, keep the jazz up. Got the jazz hat on today. Mazzy loves you.